It's taking a while, isn't it? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Spanish Wine Day. Uh, following on from Spanish Wine Week, we had uh, uh, earlier in May. So, welcome to everybody around the world who's uh, tuned in. Uh, do say hello. And maybe on the right of your screen, you'll see uh, a chat. If you want to say hello, where you're from, and uh, uh, that will be uh, interesting to see all the people from all the corners of the world. Uh, Sarah, we have Sarah. Do you ha can you hear me, Sarah? Yeah, I can hear you loud oh, and clear. Good, good, good. good. Just <laughs> don't want any technical hitches. And no. uh, assuming the audience can can hear me too, if you want to put uh, yeah hey on the chat. Okay, so as I said, welcome to um, uh, Spanish Wine Week. Uh, it's a packed day of seminars, live interviews with producers. Uh, good, good. Somebody from Belgium, uh, <laughs> Las Vegas. Right. <laughs> uh, they're coming in now, Oxford, UK. Um, so yeah, back day of, of seminars, uh, live interviews with producers who, who are keen to um, find uh, new markets. So if you're a wine importer, distributor, retailer, and able to import, you might be uh, interested in contacting those and coming up later in the program. Uh, but we'll start kicking off with, uh, as usual, with uh, our, our keynote speaker, keynote speaker, Master of Wine. Uh, this time, uh, this edition, we've got to, delighted to have uh, Sarah Jane Evans. Uh, let's just bring uh, Sarah in. Hello, Sarah. Hello, lovely to be here. And look, we have people in New York, Nova Scotia, Lebanon, Sweden. It is, you've got a great community, Anthony, great community. Korea? Yes, Korea. Yes, uh, one o'clock is kind of the optimum time. We can just yeah. get the USA early in the morning. Okay, yeah. it might be seven o'clock somewhere. And we get the the Asians uh, uh, in the evening about uh, nine o'clock or so, just before they go to bed. So, of course, Europe, no excuse, uh, <laughs> no unless excuse. you're having a lunch yeah. at this moment. So, so that's good. Yeah, we've got a good crowd in, and uh, I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to um, take us around Spain and uh, uh, look at um, white wines of Spain. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Let's see if I can get this technology working. Good. Well, very nice to be with you all. Uh, Slovakia, Atlanta, it's terrific. I'm in London. Uh, it, it, we have had we've actually been blessed during this lockdown with some great sunny weather, which helps the mood. But we're now beginning to talk, certainly in the UK community, we're beginning to talk uh, about um, what happens next. I'm sure you are too. That's why we're here today. And it's been very clear from the people I've been talking to in the wine trade in London that they are talking about having when they open up and of course some of you in some countries are already opening up um but when they open up the on trade is going to be having almost certainly shorter wine lists and those wine lists need to be much more carefully chosen so they need to give value at every at every level but they also need to give originality you know what's going to make that particular bar that particular restaurant that particular independent retailer what's going to make them different from the next person and i think an area that's been really overlooked is what's happening now in spanish white wine i think it's a category that can do give a huge amount of satisfaction and excitement so i hope to set you alight in the next um 40 45 minutes and we'll have time for questions after that so i will now this is this technology i have to say if you haven't come across it before is it's just one step up from it's just one step up from uh, zoom and it's terrific i'm not being paid to say that it's the first time i've encountered it but i must say it's really good so here we go start now just before we start i've got a poll here i'm going to see if i can do it and i'm going to start this poll which is uh, something that you can just think about while I'm I'm having a little uh, uh, introduction to Spanish wines. How many growers are there in Rias Uh And you see the numbers there. Uh, and if you would like to indicate how many growers you think there are, you'll find the answer in my presentation a little bit further on. You have to chat. You have to go out of chat and go into polls to see the poll, and then and then we will come back to the answers in a minute. Anyway, here goes new wave Spanish whites. Let's see what I have to say. Well, we're in a, a rather colourful map of Spain designed by my friend Quentin Sadler. He has a house in a town called Jesus Pobre, 
which is just here uh, on the tip, the eastern tip of uh, the Mediterranean. And uh, I think that's why there's a very little town. It's why he's put it on this very big map. But we will be coming back specifically to Jesus Pobre in my presentation. So we're going to start in on the north coast. We'll be starting with the Chakalis, which I think there's a lot of uh, revisiting Chakali that needs to be done. I'm then going to be traveling east to Catalonia. I'm going to dispose of that quite quickly. There's some very important things to say, but so Catalonia. And then I'm going to be going uh, back across, right across here, very rapidly to Baldeoras, and then I've come through to Ribeiro. And inevitably, if you're talking about Spanish whites, I'm going to be talking about Albarino. So that we'll have a little drop into Rias Baixas. Then we're going to be going back again, if you're keeping up with me, to Rioja. There's a, quite a bit to say about what's happening in Rioja. And then I'm going to go zooming down. Palomino in Jerez, and then I'm going to have a little, a little detour to Rueda up here. I hope you're still with my arrow pointing. And then I've got a few more that I want to mention. My friend in Jesus Pobre. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about Moscatel. I'm going to be talking a little bit about varieties in Ribera del Duero and down here towards Madrid. And then I'm going to be finishing up more or less in Utiel Ricana. So that's that's where I'm going a little bit and you can tell me afterwards what I've left out and I'm super excited to see that you're already filling in the poll. So what am I not going to be talking about? I don't want, really want to focus on um, the classic international grape varieties. So what I, you know, I think if you're going to be, you know, these these wines have a place, uh, you know, uh, the wines of the classic international grape varieties, white and red of Spain, they have a place in everywhere in a, in, on a good wine list. But uh, I'm particularly interested in talking to you about the local uh autochthonous, as the Spanish would say, the autochthonous grape varieties. So I won't be mentioning to you uh, the wine on the left, which is the Bignes del Vera Gewurztraminer. What I would say is if you go into a blind tasting, which I do every year as co-chairman of the Decanter World Wine Awards, if you get a, a blind, a uh, Gewurztraminer from Spain, which comes from Samontano, then you know it's going to be this wine. It's an absolute classic of its kind, it does it super well, very often gets silver medals, and but at the same time, each time I go to Samontano, I think, do I really need Gewurztraminer in, in Samontano? Shouldn't they be doing the Garnachas? Uh, it's a question to you, perhaps. The next wine, the wine in the middle, is an Iren, which is the most planted white. But again, I'm not going to be talking about that because Iren has uh, a separate purpose in, in terms of distillation. But if you're going to have Iren, and there is a lot of it in Spain, then what's quite interesting about this one I just found online is that it's organic. And I think perhaps that makes it a selling point. Uh, but anyway, I'm not going to be talking about Iren. And then thirdly, I wanted to have a Chardonnay from uh, Chivita family estates. You know, if there is a, a Chardonnay that was bidding to be the best Chardonnay in Spain, then it was one from the Chivita family estates stable. Um, their consultant was the late Professor Denis Dubordieu, as, as you know, from Bordeaux, and he really made a great Chardonnay, but I'm not here to talk about Chardonnay. <laughs> if you want to have it, this is a new one from, from Julian Chivite, and it's a very interesting wine, but it's not, uh, it's not a native. So I like to put this slide up because I, I want to give an impression of where I think Spanish white wine might be today. Because if I talk to a number of people in, in who, who aren't really specialists in Spain, uh, they will be saying, oh yeah, well, the Spanish white wine is, can be a bit flabby, a bit oaky, uh, sometimes a bit oily. Um, but I think they often talk about white wine, white grapes with wood and age making um, something Spanish, except perhaps for Albarino, which is 
very well known and perhaps Badejo. So here I want to show you something of how I feel about Spanish white wine today. Uh, first of all, on the left, I've got a granite post from a vineyard in uh, Rios Baixas because granite is the really essential mineral there and it's, it's in the ground, it makes the um, stonework, it's everywhere. And granite is a very important um, char characteristic. It may not, the wines may not taste of granite, granite because they're also influenced by the sea there, but that mineral character is important. Below that, I've got slate. Again, I don't think that really looks, that looks more like a, it was a piece of slate I picked up on, on Google Images. So it doesn't necessarily look like the kind of slate you're going to find in a, in a vineyard, but slate is really drives some of the greatest wines in, in Spain. And so slate is something I wanted to have there to give that stony character as well. In the middle, I've got a vineyard. The middle of the top is from Rueda, in fact, but it has those those brown stones, and it's a it's a little reminder of it looks. Uh, you, you have the feeling of the height of of Rueda there, but also of the you know, mini Chateau Neuf du Pape like pebbly stones. So that's another different stony characteristic. And then the bottom right, you might well be able to guess that's a vineyard in Jerez. It's that terrific calcium carbonate soil look at it it's glowing white uh, it's, uh, it's it's such an exciting thing when you go to a hair rest vineyard and then finally obviously the citrus character I think it's important to to point out but this you may wonder about this bit of fabric in the middle I was trying to find a way to express what we're going to find in some of these wines which is texture and this is really all about those wines which are not floral and they're not uh, citric but they have yes they have texture and i think in white in white wine language and in wine language generally it's a word we've really started to use so we can start our journey around our rapid journey around spain with chacoli and um i've got a i've got hon, hon well honda ribi zuri now anybody who who lives or works in that area will be able to give me a better pronunciation i've spent an interesting afternoon yesterday arguing with a discussing with a colleague on decanter magazine because when i wrote my book on the wines of northern spain last year i talked about honda ribby zuri and honda ribby belza and when i wrote an article for decanter recently they said no no no, you need to use the spelling honda rabbi which actually is widespread you'll find it in wikipedia and all over so i put honda rabbi here and then Yesterday, I was going through the huge wine grapes book uh, written by Jancis Robinson and Jose Vuillemos and Julia Harding, and it spelt it Honda Ribby, which is what I, I put in my own book originally. So up to you if you're writing um, a wine list or you're, you're, you've got it on your list of imports, um, either Honda Ribby or Honda Ribby. So... Um, what I, I just want to make the point here is that if you talk to anyone about chocolate, they're going to say to you, oh, yes, it's that acid drink which you pour from a height. It's very cheap and it's slightly fizzy and it's it's quirky and it's actually made. It's made for our new climate change world uh, where we're looking for cooler drinks. But the thing about chocolate is that it can be so much more than that. So I particularly want to point out uh of the, of the three chacolis, Biscaya, which is round about Bilbao, um, they're not all coastal vineyards, but mostly they are. But there's a company I really like, Donieni Garondona, who have, um, who make white chacolis, which are much more, I hesitate to say, they're much more Chardonnay-like. Um, then Obviously, also worth knowing, it's Asmendi and Gorka is is a Giri. Uh, in Alava, Alava is the tiniest of the three chapelies, uh, but they have a super interesting company, Astubitha, who are making some very very good wines and a gin as well. I had the Astubitha gin the other day and thought it was great. So that's a something else different to think about stocking. And then finally, Guitaria is in a sense has made itself best known companies like Chomineche and Amestoy, they're the kind of classic um, t 
typical uh, traditional chakali. So when I learned about chakali from the Wine and Spirit Educational Trust, when I was learning, then we just learned about one type of chakali, which was fizzy. What I'm really glad to see now is that there's a, this diversity coming in, which is reinforced by the fact that uh, our tally to the producer who are based in the Rioja region also have a sparkling wine um, made there. And I just want to point out here, we haven't got time to cover it now, um, that uh, Asturias has some super interesting, brightly flavoured wines. I will be talking about them a little bit more this afternoon in the presentation on red wines. So I'm glad to see that you're filling in the poll on um, how many growers are there in Rears Uh So I'll, we'll be getting to the correct answer quite soon. So we now go very quickly over to uh, um, Catalonia and to Chirolo, um, which you can see has some other synonyms. I've been giving you the synonyms. I, it, it's a very historic wine. Um, Sitges, that great seaside uh, sunny centre, uh, is, is where it was first mentioned in print in 1785. Um, it was... I think I learnt again, uh, traditionally you learnt with the WSET that it was one of the three great varieties that went to make carver, but it was never really taken very seriously. And what's super interesting now is that people are highlighting Charello as a great variety you uh, need to know about. It's the one for long ageing and it's and then a lovely statistic. Um, Apparently, or lovely fact, it's high in resveratrol, which apparently protects it against vineyard diseases. But what surely we all know is that resveratrol is the thing that's tremendously good for our health. So I haven't yet discovered how much uh, resveratrol beneficial to humans there is in, um, let's say, uh, a, glass and a, a glass and a half of Chirello, but it would be good to know. So here we are. I've... I've Brought in three examples. As I said, it was a, a carver mainstay um, and it's very much part of the Catalan identity, not just in terms of uh, it, the fact of its being there, but also that it really that's where you find Chirillo. Um, and part of that Catalan identity, I think, is uh, terrifically good label design. Uh, the Catalans do have very inspirational, um, you know, across Spain generally, I think its packaging is great, but there's some very good label design in Catalonia. So the one on the left is from Gramona, which is a uh, biodynamically produced one. And I see here from my tasting notes that it has, after spent being some of it fermented in French oak, um, it's aged partly in concrete, and partly in amphoras, and the concrete is egg-shaped, which is why it's called ovum. Um, so that that gives you, at a stroke, um, Gramona, a very respected historic um, sparkling wine, traditional method sparkling wine producer, biodynamic, um, concrete eggs, terracotta amphoras, you know, you, you've ticked every box there, but actually it's a delicious wine. Uh, and then I have two wines here from uh, La Charelle, which as you see is more or less Charello in reverse, lovely company, um, very dynamic, doing uh, some super interesting Carver too, uh, and very into na natural winemaking. So um, if you're looking for either natural wines or wines with a a mineral purity, Chirillo from um, around here may be just the kind of thing you need. So the next variety, and I, I saw that Andrew is uh, online here, the next variety is Garnacha Blanca. Uh, and Terra Alta is a place to be. This is a really fascinating thing that Terra Alta is really a, quite a small DO, but it has um, half of uh, of the all the Garnacha in Spain and Spain is a very dominant producer of garnacha, so it's um, uh, it, it's you know a really really significant place. Terra Alta has all sorts of other claims to fame, most particularly um, the site of uh, terrible battles in in the Second World in the Civil War 
just before the Second World War, and you can still find traces of, um, you know, what was left behind by the soldiers, uh, the poorly equipped soldiers in the really terrible Battle of the Ebro. So Garnacho Blanca, though, I'm very keen to mention because uh, it's another one of those great varieties which people would say to you, well, you know, it's a bit flabby, uh, it's a bit alcoholic, uh, doesn't get to be very high in acidity. We're not, you know, why would you buy it? Well, the answer is you'd buy it because what you can see in Spain at the moment is super interesting. So I would say I've given you some trends here. It's really driving the white wine category in pre and Monsant, uh, as well as Terra Alta. Um, it, it is the textured wine and you'll be finding it also in Rioja and obviously in Aragon where it was originally. So I have uh, here one wine from Herentia Altes, who are a um, well-known producer in Terra Alta. Uh, I have Editaria, who are a very established business also. And then I have one here from uh, my good friend Fernando Mora, who was a keynote speaker at your at Spanish Wine Week, who is a, um, a grower in a grower and winemaker in um, Aragon. And his brand is Frontonio. And he's transforming um, with uh, using old vines, using concentrated old vines, um, the, uh, she's, he's transfor transforming the knowledge and understanding and, and uh, um, respect for these grape varieties. So, uh, oh, and I've, I've been wisely, thank you, Ken, and thank you, Marius. I, sure, I was trying not to say, I didn't think I did say uh, that Gramona is not Carver. I think I said Gramona is traditional method sparkling wine. If I didn't say that, forgive me, I'm quite careful about this. I didn't start talking about what Gramona is now. It's a member of Corpinat. You've had a presentation in Spanish Wine Week about that because, you know, that's that's another section to talk about. And indeed, you've got a sparkling wine week coming up. Um, but certainly Gramona is a producer of uh, still and sparkling wines of a very fascinating kind, well worth a visit. Um, so thank you for the correction. If I did say Carver, I, I'm surprised, but um, uh, I, I'm glad that you've pointed that out. So now we're going to go flying back to uh, the northwest and we're going to go to the Godeo grape variety. I've, I've picked here one producer who I feel very strongly about, but you'll also find Godeu across the Galician Dios and also in Bietho. Um, it's, uh, I've mentioned here the families it belongs to. Godeu nearly disappeared and there were two guys who worked very hard with a, a Godeu revival project in the 1980s and we owe them a great De deal because it's such a lovely, lovely grape variety, and it is a grape variety that when you have it from, when you have it uh, and age it, it becomes something transformational. So the the, the transformational wines I've found have been the wines of Rafael Palacios, who I think probably makes I would regard uh, his top wines as the best, the best white wines in Spain. I think. Uh, and why do I say I think? Let's be bold about this. I think they really are exceptional. And I've included here just rather than the regular picture of the vineyard, I've included a photo from his Instagram page. He's worth following, Rafael Palacios Viticultor. And um, there's the sheep he uses for um, a particular kind of a craggy sheep that he uses for fertilizer and you can see in, in the partially obscured text that that he's uh uses them within his biodynamic preps but here's a man who's basically spent 20 years on 20 something little parcels just in baldeoras working away working away making ever finer ever better wines they're really really terrific anyway <laughs> maybe I'm getting carried away there, but just try them. I think they're great. And what he has got is he's got a pyramid. So, you know, you may not be able to afford, you know, I may not be able to afford to buy the top end or to taste them often, but at least one can 
and to lower down the range. So if you're in Baleoras, uh, thank you, Anna. Um, you've just pointed out the mistake on my slide, which I, I found this morning, but it was then too late to change. Um, Prieto Picudo is indeed a red variety, and I'm not quite certain why. I think my fingers must have got typed away, run away with themselves. I'm expecting to say something else, but, but thank you, Anna, because you're um, absolutely right. Um, Treshadora. Treshadora is not going to be uh, a single variety that you're going to have on a, on a wine list or on a shelf saying, this is my single variety, Treshadora. It's something that typically turns up in Galicia and blends, but it is super interesting. And it makes the top wines, it makes are exceptional. Um, the, and the top, wine of the, the top wine of the top wine of that you find in Ribeiro is made by this delightful gentleman, Emilia Rojo. Um, and I feel very um, warm towards it because I do a huge amount of blind tasting, which I simply have to do for uh, a, 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 as objective as they can be, objective tastings for Decanter magazine. So we had a lineup of, uh, let's say, um, it was about 100 Galician whites tasted blind. And I hadn't come across this wine before. And it absolutely sang in the tasting. It's a really, really special thing. Um, and... Emilio Rocha was formerly a, a Siemens engineer. Uh, he moved back to this property with, which, of his wife's and it's only 1.2 hectares. So it's a little bit like um, Rafael Palacios, who I mentioned before. He's someone who's just focused on the same piece of land and has produced something super special. Um, and he's recently been purchased by Paga de Cara Ovejas in Ribera del Duero, which I, at the beginning I thought, oh, is this, is this going to be a great idea? But he, you know, he hasn't got any children. And in fact, the project that they've now, the, the Pago is now set up uh, by, by also purchasing the very special Biniamain and bringing in a very smart consultant winemaker, I think gives me great confidence for the future that, that actually uh, Emilio Rocco as a as the one wine from this one producer will continue to be something something special. Let's keep going. And here we are in Albarino. And here's the answer to our poll. Now let's take a look. 46% uh, of you uh, said correctly, uh, got it right, there are 5,177 growers. Um, I had 7% who thought there might have been 5,090, 23% to 5,104, and 23% of you who also thought 5,231. So spot on. Well done for, for your 5,177. What it does, what that poll does, is it reminds you, or reminds me, that the very distinctive thing about Albarino in Rios Baixas is that there are so many tiny plots, so many growers, uh, spread across not so much vineyard. So the management exercise of it is extraordinarily complicated. And indeed, there are only about five or six really, as you know, really big companies in, in, in Rios Baixas. For that reason, um, it's, uh, it's a completely different kind of economy. So, yeah, where does it come from? You know the argument. Was it originally Spanish? Was it originally Portuguese? No, well, it's they're very close to each other. I, you know, I believe it's Spanish, but then I would perhaps. How it's certainly Albarino has a distinctive stylistic character and an adaptation to its zone, which means it's been there for a very long, been in Spain or in Rios Baixas for a very long time. Uh, and it has got a parcel of very old vines. And what I would also say is that it's almost worth looking at Rias Baixas because Rias Baixas is not one uh, conjoined DO. In that sense, you could say it's more like a mini carver. It, it is a series of separate islets put together for political reasons. Um, sensibly, I think, you know, when, when Rias Baixas was created, uh, clearly there was a, a pull amongst many people to have separate DOs and they put them all together. And probably at that time, they nearly did need to bang heads together. Um, and now things are changing, perhaps. There's another um, sub-region which wants to express itself. Um, 
possibly um, one one could make a separate deal. But I think probably Albarino reespanish us is the strongest message you get in in um, Galicia, and in marketing terms, it's something that really needs to be um, really needs to be made uh, clear. So what I've got here is two wines I wanted to mention to you. One is on the left, the Mar de Frades Sparkling. Uh, at a conference I once said in Galicia, in, at the Instituto Gallego de Vinos, I once said, sparkling Albarino, traditional method Albarino is, is not a thing. It won't work or it'll work where you are, but I don't see it in export. Actually, I was completely wrong. If you can do it properly, it's, it's a much, it's a, it's a very, interesting wine and it's more enjoyable i think than new zealand's version of sparkling sauvignon blanc so um that's it's it's you don't often see it outside spain but it's quite an interesting original thing um and the second one is um Pato de Senorans. and marius is just asking what was the name of the woman who built up the region from 1986 from Pato de Senorans? well I'm very delighted to say she's Marisol Bueno, Marius. And Marisol was the driving person who made sure that Rias Baixas worked. She's, uh, uh, I'm currently chairman of the Gran Order and the Caballeros Divino for people who work in, um, have, have worked in England, Spain for Spanish wines. And Marisol is another Caballero. So, yeah, Marisol Bueno, very, very significant figure. So what she has, amongst other things, is this um, Selección de Añada, which I think is a terrific wine. And it proves again, like Godejo, that it's a variety, and like Chacolí, that it's a variety that really uh, benefits from some age. I have trouble convincing some of my colleagues in the UK about this who say, no, no, Albarino is a wine that you make last year, drink this year, that's it. But actually, Albarino aged on its lees for three months with bottle, uh, three months, three years with bottled, bottle age is something super delicious. So um, you have to get the right vineyard and the right producer, but that's a very nice category. So we now have these wines um, with age, uh, with distinct characteristics where you might have put uh, another Chardonnay on your list from somewhere in the world, you could go back and try something different. So let's move on to another key producer in uh, Albarina in Rio Spicious, who I really wanted to mention, and he's terribly well known, I'm sure, to all of you, all of you um, is Eulogio Pomares. And Eulogio and, and his wife here have a family estate which has an extremely long history and he's he's both committed to the old ways and also extremely innovative and has made here a rather exciting rosé which I saw for the first time in a tasting in London this spring which is a blend of Albarino with the two red varieties Espadero and Caña Tinta uh, and he's a member of a group called Futuro Vignador which I I should be mentioning again, which has just quite recently formed itself. Uh, it launched itself, uh, at least for those of us who are in the UK, in London in um, February. And they're a, a group of about 15 um, producers who are committed to family producers, committed to uh, our, uh, local grape varieties, uh, traditional methods of working, and to teaching each other. So they've they've had classes on uh, building dry stone walls, they've done classes on viticulture, all sorts of things. So it's at the heart of, it, you know, you could see it as a marketing ploy. If somebody comes up to you and say, well, you know, I'm a Futuro Vignador, but they're all of them very, very clear that it's not about marketing, it's a commitment to quality. Um, and what they need to do is to to get some more members because they're really too small a group at the moment, but uh, all of them, very lovely characters and uh, you can, well, you can follow their website. So what we need now is just a, just a break for, uh, we might have been all having lunch together if I'd been doing this face to face with you. So I, I went uh, running through my um, 
photos just just to pick out things that said to me galician white wines you know this is you know why are you drinking spanish white wines because they're terrifically gastronomic uh these different characteristics are super lovely with food you can't you don't yes you can have them white by the glass but a little bit of food will be a very good thing. So top left hand corner, I was, those are some terrific mussels, which we had, which have been, uh, as it were, picked from, from the bay that morning by uh, a producer, Dega Pombal, uh, in Salnez. Um, then at, at the bottom left, they'd also had this amazing uh, pasta and clam dish. Uh, you know, the freshest, the freshest of all. In the middle, there's an octopus, as I'm sure you can see. And it was really just um, a brief anecdote to say I was given a, a prize by the people of Ribeiro, uh, by the, the Consaco Regulador. Um, and so part of the prize was was to receive it to, and to go out and uh, have a boat trip. Um, and while we were out on a boat trip, a uh, lovely old couple came from Ocabayuna, which is the best place to get to get octopus in Pulpo in really, I think, in Spain, just near there. So when we got back, this uh, couple had got their burner up and had been cooking the octopus. And they said to me, you're the guest of honour. Um, you know, would you like would you please come and cut up the octopus? So I'm, I'm a kind of queasy Londoner. Uh, never never get out outside the city so i was like no really i think the experts should cut it up um and then and then the uh pulpo came and it's served as you always have it on the wooden dishes with oil and with paprika on top of it and really and, and, co and cocktail sticks and i don't know i had about three plates of these and I thought, I simply can't have any more. My husband was with me. So I said, look, you're going to have to go on eating on my behalf because I think I've, I've really had enough. And then I said to him, I don't think there's anything else coming. So I think you should, you know, make your lunch of it. I can't see any other food being cooked. And that, which is the awful situation uh, where um, uh, it, it's the awful situation <laughs> you do get into uh, sometimes uh, uh, if you're, um fussy about pulpo like i am so um anyway at the end of it in fact uh there was fish and then there was meat and then um, potatoes and uh something sweet and cups of coffee and so on and uh they told me that 16 of us had eaten 25 kilos of, pul of pulpo so since then if you ever invite me out for uh, a tapa it's very 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 unlikely that i shall eat the <laughs> pulpo that's on the table. Uh, now on the right you can see that this was a lunch I had with Rafael Palacios where he produced assortes and his kind of mildly more entry-level wine Luro and he'd served it, it was served in, in a local restaurant with a terrific tuna steak um, and these these wines can go with meaty meaty dishes as well as with fresh ones. Um, Ken uh, has a, just made a lovely comment I, I want to mention. I constantly encounter the prejudice that Spanish uh, in Germany, that Spanish, the Spanish cannot make good white wine, not as well as Germany anyway. Do you encounter this prejudice anywhere in the world? Yes, exactly, I do. And I think, Ken, I would add that the British uh, are always looking for the cheapest wine. I, I think if anybody from the UK listening to this would agree that there's a so, you know, you have to change the argument into we're looking for bargains uh, or we're looking for good value. Uh, but unfortunately, Spain has for a number of structural reasons and it's still continuing production of bulk wine. It does have this reputation as being the source of cheap wine. But I think what you can get now is terrific uh, uh, white wines. Very different from Riesling, though some people would say that, for instance, that some people would say that Riesling and Albarino are related, though I don't believe that's the case. But there is an extraordinary diversity and definitely things to find, but we're all going to have to work uh, at, at making people perceive that value. So I've now got another poll. Let's do... Uh, See if I can find another one. And I've got a poll which is relates to what's coming up. So you need to do this quickly uh, about Rioja. 
and the, the, I'm going to be talking about Maturana Blanca in Rioja. So how many hectares are there? So if you'd like to have a quick look at that poll while I'm talking, we can take it forward. So here we are. This is why I'm saying you need to do it quickly because Maturana Blanca is about to turn up. Um, obviously, if I'm talking about Rioja, uh, then I'm talking about Biura. And Biura, if Garnacha Blanca was unpopular, then I think a bureau was particularly unpopular, um, but it's had a great transformation. Uh, I think that it's something now that you can, there are two great bureaus. There's the one from Marcos de Morieta and there's the one uh, from uh, Lopez Heredia. But I think, and you know, there's people like Finca Allende, uh, well, you know, the, one can begin to name the great, the great bureaus, uh, but then there's a new tradition making it more in a stainless steel uh, crisp and crunchy style so there are different approaches and particularly um, I think uh, the use of turning back on the oak or choosing better oak um, or choosing larger oak is making for a, a much greater range of choices so Bura is well worth revisiting. Tempranillo Blanco is has become the 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 one that was the, the surprise find in 1988 um, and look now there's uh, 450 hectares in Rioja it's it's a great marketing ploy and but I, I I haven't yet been totally convinced about how it works as a variety but talking to winemakers they they think it has real potential um, and now let us find the answer to Maturana Blanca uh, well that's interesting 33 percent of you correctly thought there were 32 hectares of Maturana Blanca, 25% uh, of you thought there were 42 hectares, 41% of you thought there were 52 hectares, which I must say is what I would have thought, and yeah, nobody, nobody thought there was more than that. So the interesting thing about Maturana Blanca is it looks like it was Rioja's original white grape variety, what, although it appeared under different names. However, um, it's was and it was reauthorized in 2007 so it began to be recuperated and here I've got two uh two wines one from Binia Ijalba and one which was part of an experimental project by Binia Pomal um and it hasn't yet really dug itself in but it has uh, a very good structure. I think potentially it could be a very good wine for aging. So I think that's a point of difference. Uh, while uh, you know it's not Tempranillo and Tempranillo Blanco, it's not Bura. Uh, I think it it should be something to look out for. And I think actually these two um, are very pleasing, very pleasing wines indeed. So now something completely different. Let's go down to Palomino Fino. Palomino Fino, yeah, uh, possibly named after a 13th century person whose name was Palomino. Um, Palomino is, you know, we all learn about it as the sherry grape, the sherry grape that really only works because it then spends uh, eight time in a solera where it, so it's a wine that's made in the bodega, isn't it? Well, in fact, now at last there's a movement to say the point is it's not just made in the bodega, the vineyard camps and the people who've really been driving that story uh, are these two guys in the bottom left on the left in the blue shirt Willie Perez and on the right in the white shirt Ramiro Banias who comes from uh, San Luca Willie comes from a uh, sherry family in Jerez so they, they're the two complementary parts of the sherry zone and they've been uh, researching the history uh, working with others talking about particular vineyards and also bringing about the practice of not fortifying uh, the grapes, but leaving them to sun dry. I can remember going back, uh, going in, going into the vineyard in Jerez in, well, you know, the very early 1980s, maybe even the very late 1970s, years ago, and seeing people drying grapes on the ground to add that uh, extra degree of um, alcohol, which is now what a practice that they're reintroducing to just have the wines being with a little bit more alcohol, but not being fortified. Somebody else who's who's also working in that area, and there's a whole, whole very exciting collective of people is Alejandro Mochada, this, this character here on the right, holding his bottle. Uh, Ali is, uh, works with um, 
a, sh a chap from Champagne called David Leclerc, uh, David Leclerc, and so Muchada Leclerc produces these um, Burgundy-like bottles of Palomino wine, not fortified, super interesting to drink. And I've just mentioned two here, but there's a great movement. So I think that if you're looking for a wine that's not Sauvignon Blanc-like, you can't sell it to customers as being super floral, um, but a wine that has texture and, and pedigree too, then Palomino can be rather exciting. And here we have next Palomino Fino in other places. Now, um, there is Palomino in Bietho. It, it appears in blends, but if, for instance, you you um, have any of the top rib blends of Descendientes de Jota Palacios, um, that's Ricardo Perez Palacios, he will have a grape in with his Menthea called Jerez, and that's Palomino Fino, because it's, it's just in the vineyard. Then um, in Tenerife, it's been in Tenerife for an extremely long time. <clears throat> and uh, in Tenerife, it's called Listan Blanco. And I have here one on the right from uh, Tenerife from Embinati, but I think Suetas del Marquez is very well known. Uh, and in Rueda, it's, it was planted as a regular grape variety, but historically they made a wine called Dorado. And here's a, a new or a revival of it from De Alberto, which has had a huge amount of success. It's um, aged in it's aged in Damajuanas for 16 months. It, it goes into Solera. It's 45 to 17 percent, and it's a really lovely wine. Uh, and of course, and then and then also I have a, another wine here from uh, Bierzo as well. But uh, of course, we found Palomino Fino all around the world. Um, and coming very nearly to the end, uh, sadly, of our time together, two varieties I want to mention, Moscatel. Uh, people are very down on Moscatel, especially Spanish Moscatel, because it's Moscatel de Alejandria and it's not thought to be so good, but it can make terrific dry wines. And I've got two producers here, Les, Les Freses, which comes from, if you remember that little town called Jesus Pobre. Um, and this is... This producer has several. Uh, this is her amphora wine, and here she is standing next to her amphoras. And then very famous producer in the area, Pepe Mendoza, who's got a new project. Uh, he is from the brand Enrique Mendoza, but his new project is Casa Agricola, and he's got super lovely, super lovely wine. Really, really putting that region, Alicante, back on the map. And then we have the Albillos, which I just wanted to introduce because Ribera del Duero has now got its own recognised white wine, Albio Mayor. Uh, so that's something if you're if you're selling Ribera del Duero, you need to think about. Uh, there's Albio Real, it's different. Uh, there are a lot of Albios around. Albio Real has appeared uh, properly in its own right in Sebreros, which is the latest of the DOs, which was. Um, uh, well, it only launched properly in 2018. I was just there last year, uh, which is Garnacha and Albia Real. Something just north of Madrid, something worth taking a look at. And then we have something different, not the same family at all, Albia. And this one comes from this particular lovely wine, comes from Manchuela. And Juan Antonio Ponce, who's family name is, is, well, whose brand name is Ponce too, makes a really, really super interesting wine called Reto from, from Albia. Well, and now we come to maybe another, not very well-known winery, but wine, great variety, but with great wines behind it. Sorry, so Sarah's just uh, left the room <laughs> unexpectedly. We hope to have her back. So um, if you just bear with us a moment, here she comes. I'm back. Brilliant. Thank you. And you can hear me. Hear me well. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the um, uh, it's Mercigera, 
which I was introduced to by the company on the right, Muskio, who have their own uh, had this vineyard of Masagera, which seemed again to be rather uninteresting, but they have made it out of it a very exciting wine and a new company here, uh, Balavar, um, who have lovely old vine Masagera as well. So that's a revival that's happening in the roundabout Utia Riquena Valencia, that particular area. So this brings me to the almost to the end and to questions to you, and you may have questions to me. Um, there are other writers I could have mentioned, Mama Juelo, Thalema, Pedro Jimenez, obviously, which is making lovely wines, uh, Malbasia Bocanica in La Palma, Malbasia Rioja, and of course, the very obvious one I missed was Badejo. So um, that is the rapid end to my presentation, but I'm here to answer your questions. And I would say that because I just popped out from the presentation there, I've lost all your questions. So if there's anything you'd particularly like to ask me in the last few minutes uh, before this session of, of the, the wine day ends, please type it in now and I'm very happy to reply. So, slides. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Didn't, didn't good, miss good, any good. questions, so... Uh... Great. Well, it's it's been a terrifically lively audience, uh, and I hope, I mean, I think one of the, the points that was raised by Ken about prejudice is a really important one. I think Spanish white wines do have to face, uh, face quite a bit of prejudice, so, um, you know, we're here to, to, to make sure that's not the case. Right. Uh, well, just to mention, Baldoma, you just mentioned there, I think the Dio Valencia, they, they were on the Spanish Wine Week uh, last time. So if anybody wants to um, catch them, they're on the, the website, oh. Baldoma. And uh, coming up, we've got um, a Chacoli producer, um, Tome Vino selection. Uh, we'll ask Gorka uh, about the Ondarabi or Ondaribi yep. dilemma. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We'll and we've also know. got yep. Hammock and Sellers who are also presenting a, a wine from the Rias Basha. So, um, um, so people, they're up next at quarter past. Um, and we just put the link up there for you so that you can just click on there and uh, we'll, we'll join you again at uh, quarter past two. Uh, there's a, question, a couple of questions come in in the meantime, Sarah. Yes, yeah, so I can see, Ken, yes, thank you very much for asking about my Southern Spain book. That's the question, uh, having done the wines of Northern Spain, my Central and Southern Spain uh, book is what I should be doing now, uh, but it's much more fun to be talking to you. So uh, if we're lucky, it will come out near the end of the next year. That's what my publisher's hoping. Sam, did I miss any mention of Badejo? Um, I, no, I was only a very brief mention because I think that Badejo is something that's really pretty well established in the marketplace there are some good things happening there but um i think i wanted to talk about some other lesser known varieties um and utia Requena, um yes utia Requena. i think i should come back to in a red session because it really is it's all about babal and that's the thing i would really like to focus on um utia Requena has has macabeo has masagera um but Babal is the great story there. Uh, and thank you. I think those are the questions. I look forward to seeing you a bit later this afternoon. Right. Thanks, Sarah. Yes, it's 5.30. We're back with Sarah Jane Evans uh, on Reds of the Northwest, uh, Northwest Spain. And uh, next up, as I said, we've got live interviews with producers from Bith. Caico Chacolina, that's Tome Vino selection. Then we've got um, Hammock and Sellers, uh, Rias Bashas and Humilla, and followed by De Muller, Catalonia, be presenting uh, wine from a Priorat and wine from the uh, Tarragona designation of origin. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I shall see you later. Whoops, you're gone again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we hope to see you again uh, in 15 minutes or so. Just, just click on the link, top of your um, chat screen, and uh, we'll be back uh, at quarter past two, Spanish local time. Thank you.